today we're going to be talking about how to express an integral in six different ways. And in this particular video, we're going to be talking about a triple integral of the function f of x, y, z. In other words, f is in terms of three variables, x, y, and z. A triple integral is going to allow us to find the volume underneath that function over some region e. Now, we can express this integral in six different ways depending on the order of integration. Because we have three variables, x, y, and z in a triple integral, we can integrate first with respect to x, then y, then z, or first with respect to x, then z, then y, or we can start with y, or we can start with z. If we write out permutations of that combination of variables, we'll see that we get six different ways to express the integral, and we can go ahead and make that list right now. So let's go ahead and say x, y, z, or we can start with x and flip the order after that, z, then y. We can start with y, then say x and z, or y then z then x, or we can start with z and do x then y, or start with z and then do the opposite order, y then x. These are going to be the six different ways that we can express the integral. The only thing that's going to change about our triple integral is the order of integration, but also the limits of integration. We need to find limits of integration in terms of x, y, and z, but they're going to need to change depending on the order of integration. In other words, in general, our integrals are going to look like this. Our triple integrals are going to be triple integral like this. We'll leave ourselves some space. We'll come back and fill this in later. Of the function f of x, y, z, f of x, y, z, like this, then we're going to say our order of integration is x, then y, then z, which means after this we write dx, dy, dz. That means we're going to integrate first with respect to x, then with respect to y, then with respect to z. Now, in terms of the limits of integration, this first integral is where we're going to write the limits of integration with respect to x, because remember that with triple integrals, we're dealing with like a sandwich here. So because dx is on the inside, the innermost integral is going to have the limits of integration for x. Then as we move to the outside, we get dy. That means this middle integral is going to have limits of integration with respect to y. And then the last variable here is dz. That means our outermost integral, this third one here, is going to have limits of integration with respect to z. Well, what we're trying to do here with triple integrals is by the time we've integrated with respect to x and then with respect to y and we get to dz, our final answer, all we want to have left is z variables. And when we get to just having z variables left over, we want to be able to plug in constant limit of integrations. In other words, just real numbers that don't involve some other variable. We want to be able to plug in those constant limits of integration so that we get an actual value for this definite triple integral, one that doesn't involve variables. We'll just get an answer like 2 or 16 thirds or some real number like that. That's our goal. Well, in order to make that happen, that means we have to have constant limits of integration with respect to z because we can only be plugging in real numbers at the end. For our limits of integration with respect to y and x, we can still have and should have variables involved in the limits of integration. Notice though that every time we change the order of integration, like if we integrate first with respect to x, then z, then y, as in this second example here, we'll have dx dz dy. In that case, we're going to want constant limits of integration for y instead of for z. And the limits of integration for x and z can have variables involved. So what we're getting at here is we're going to need to find several different limits of integration for x, y, and z depending on the order of integration. So the way that I like to do this, I like to make a table. Here's what we're going to do. Going down the left hand side of our table, we're going to have x, then y, then z variables. Going across the top, we're going to have the same three, x, then y, then z, but I'm going to add a fourth column. I'm going to call it multi. In other words, multiple variables left over. If we look just in this first row here for x, this first row for x going across the top, 
I want to have limits of integration for x in terms of x, and this is just my own chart, it's not super technical, but basically I want my constant limits of integration in this first column here. In my second column, x in terms of y, I want an equation for x in terms of y. I want limits of integration for x that only involve y. In my third column, I want limits of integration for x that only involve z. And in my multi-column, I want limits of integration for x that involve y and z. So we'll start to get a picture of this as we go. But in order to find constant limits of integration for x, what I want to do is plug in 0 for y and 0 for z into my equation y equals 4 minus x squared minus 4z squared. When I do that, I'll get 0 equals 4 minus x squared minus 4z squared. I'm just going to get that 0 for 4z squared because I'm plugging in 0 for z. When I add x squared to both sides, I'll get x squared equals 4. Taking the square root of both sides, I'll get x equals positive or negative square root of 2. That's a real number that involves no other variable. There's no y or z variables involved here, just real numbers. These are my constant limits of integration for x, so I'm going to say positive and negative square root 2. Now I can do the same thing for y. To find constant limits of integration for y, I'm going to plug in 0 for x and z. So I'm going to get y equals 4 minus 0 minus 0, so I'm just going to get y equals 4. Well, I need two limits of integration, an upper and a lower. I only have y equals 4 here. Well, if I go back to my original problem, notice that they've also given us y equals 0. The reason they did is because they knew we were going to run into this problem where we only found this upper limit of integration. We need to use both. So we're going to say we have 0 and 4 as our upper and lower limit of integration for y with respect to y, where there's no other variable x or z involved. It's just real numbers as our limits of integration for y. Now for z with respect to z, I'm going to plug in 0 for x and y. I'm going to get 0 equals 4 minus x squared, so minus 0 there, minus 4z squared. If I add 4z squared to both sides, I get 4z squared equals 4. Dividing both sides by 4, I get z squared equals 1. I can see that I'm then going to get z is equal to positive or negative 1. So I can go ahead here in z with respect to z and say positive or negative 1. These are my real number limits of integration for x, y, and z. Here's where it starts to get a little trickier. At this point, I like to go to the multi column because I'm going to be solving this equation here for each variable in terms of the other two variables. Remember, multiple variables in terms of at least two other variables. So it's already solved for me for y. So I know my multi column for y is going to be 4 minus x squared minus 4z squared. Because I don't have a second option, because I don't have another limit of integration and I always need two, I'm going to pull on this y equals zero as my other limit of integration. So we're going to get zero and four minus x squared minus four z squared as my limits of integration for y. Now for x, we just need to solve this for x. So let's go ahead and add x squared to both sides and subtract y from both sides. What we're left with is x squared moves over to the left. We get on the right hand side, 4 minus, here's where the y comes in because we subtracted y from both sides, and then minus 4z squared. To get a value for x, I'll take the square root of both sides, and I get x equals positive or negative square root of 4 minus y minus 4z squared. Those are my upper and lower limits of integration for x because I have positive and negative. I have two values for x. So x in terms of both of the other variables, I have positive or negative square root of 4 minus y minus 4z squared, like that for x. I'm going to do the same thing for z. I'm going to add 4z squared to both sides and subtract y from both sides, and I get 4z squared is equal to 4 minus x squared minus y. Dividing both sides by 4, I get z squared is equal to 4 minus x squared minus y, all divided by 4. And then when I take the square root of both sides, I'm going to get z is equal to positive or negative square root of 4 minus x squared minus y over 2. 
Again, because I have positive and negative, that's two limits of integration for me. So in my multi-column for z, I'm going to say positive or negative square root of 4 minus x squared minus y all divided by 2. That's my multi-column for x, y, and z. Filling out the last of our table, we look at limits of integration for x in terms of y. Because we only have x and y involved here, that means we want to plug in 0 for z to eliminate it. So what we're going to do here is plug in 0 for z to our original equation. We'll get y equals 4 minus x squared. Plugging in 0 for z eliminates this whole negative 4z squared term. But then, because I'm looking for limits of integration for x, I want to solve this for x in terms of y. So I'm going to add x squared to both sides and subtract y from both sides. I get x squared is equal to 4 minus y. I'll take the square root of both sides to solve for x and get x is equal to positive or negative square root of 4 minus y. Those are my two limits of integration, so I'm going to say positive or negative square root of 4 minus y. I can do the same thing for x in terms of z. So what I want to do is plug in 0 for y to eliminate it. So I'm going to get 0 is equal to 4 minus x squared minus 4z squared. I want to solve for x in terms of z, so I'll add x squared to both sides to get x squared is equal to 4 minus 4z squared, and then I'll take the square root of both sides to get x equal to positive or negative square root of 4 minus 4z squared, like this. I could factor out a 4 and take the square root of that, but I really don't need to. Since we're running out of a little bit of room here, I'll put it right down here. x in terms of z is going to be positive or negative square root of 4 minus 4z squared. I've got the whole row done now for x. Now I just need y in terms of x. To do that, because we only have y and x, we'll plug in 0 for z, and we'll get y is equal to 4 minus x squared. That only gives me one limit of integration, so I need to use my 0 also, so I'm going to say 0 and 4 minus x squared. Those are my two limits of integration there. Now I just need y in terms of z. I'll plug in 0 for x to eliminate the variable I don't need, and I'll get y equals 4 minus, the x squared goes away, so I'm just left with 4z squared. I want to solve for y in terms of z, I've already got that. But I only have one limit of integration here, so I need my 0 again. So my limits of integration there are going to be 0 and 4 minus 4z squared. Lastly, I've got z in terms of x. I'll plug in 0 for y. I'll get 0 is equal to 4 minus x squared minus 4z squared. I need to solve this for z in terms of x, so I'll add 4z squared to both sides and get 4z squared is equal to 4 minus x squared. I'll divide both sides by 4 and get z squared equals 4 minus x squared all over 4. Taking the square root of both sides, I'll get z is equal to positive or negative square root of 4 minus x squared all divided by 2. Those are going to be my upper and lower limits of integration for z in terms of x. Positive or negative square root of 4 minus x squared all divided by 2, and now I need z in terms of y. Plugging in 0 for x to eliminate it, I get y is equal to 4 minus 4z squared. I'll add 4z squared to both sides and subtract y from both sides, and I'll get 4z squared is equal to 4 minus y. Dividing both sides by 4, z squared equals 4 minus y, all divided by 4. And then taking the square root, I get z is equal to positive or negative square root of 4 minus y, all divided by 2, because I take the square root of 4, I get 2. So here I'm going to have positive or negative square root of 4 minus y, all divided by 2. Now that I've got my limits of integration, it becomes easy for me to start attaching them to these triple integrals that I have set up over here. So I'm going to set up a couple as an example. I'll have the triple integral here of f of x, y, z, like this. So what we're looking at here for this first one, we're integrating first with respect to x, then y, then z. Well, I know because z is my outside variable here that I'm going to need z in terms of z, just the constant values for z. So I say z in terms of z, 
that is my positive negative one right here. So I'm gonna say that my limits of integration for z are negative one and one because z is on the outside. I know that I'm gonna be integrating first with respect to x in this triple integral. When I integrate with respect to x, I'm gonna need values of y and z left over so that I can integrate with respect to y and z. Well, I'm gonna get that always, that first variable that we're taking the integral with respect to, I'm gonna get that from my multi-column. So if I go to x and the multi-column, notice here I have limits of integration for x in terms of y and z. I've got y and z left over, which I need in order to integrate with respect to y and z. So my limits of integration here are gonna be negative square root of four minus y minus four z squared, and at the top here, positive square root of four minus y minus four z squared. So I've got that one. Then in my middle integral, I know it's with respect to y, I'm gonna need y in terms of z because I'm integrating with respect to z after I integrate with respect to y, but I don't need x's involved because I already took the integral with respect to x. So in other words, when you're integrating with respect to x, because you have y and z following it, you're gonna need limits of integration in terms of both y and z. When you're integrating with respect to y, you only have z that follows it, so you only need a limit of integration with respect to z. z is the last variable, there's no variables after it, so you need constant limits of integration. But y in terms of z, I'm gonna say y in terms of z, that's these right here, zero and four minus four z squared. So I'm gonna say zero to four minus four z squared. That's expressing the integral in one way. Let's move on and do a different example so we've got more space. Let's do this second to last one here, z then x then y. So if I write my integrals here and I say f of x, y, z like this, I know that I'm integrating first with respect to z then x then y. So I say dz, dx, dy. I know that I need limits of integration for z that are in terms of the two variables that follow it, x and y. So I say z, I go to my multi-column. These values right here, I'm going to get negative square root of 4 minus x squared minus y, all divided by 2. Here I'm going to get positive square root of 4 minus x squared minus y, all divided by 2. For limits of integration for x, I need limits of integration for x in terms of the only variable that follows it, y. So I go here, x in terms of y, and I see positive and negative square root of 4 minus y. So I get negative square root of 4 minus y to positive square root of 4 minus y. Then for limits of integration with respect to y, there are no variables that follow this one. It's the last variable, so I need limits of integration for y that are constant. I go to y in terms of y, there's my 0 and 4, so I say from 0 to 4, and that's how we express the integral for z, x, y. You can get the idea to do the other four integrals, but that's how you use the order of integration to change the limits of integration each time. That's how you can express a triple iterated integral in six ways.